Good afternoon, everybody. So to start with my presentation, I'm going to need your help. So I would like for everyone here to imagine that they're sitting, let's say, at a dinner table surrounded by people that you know, friends and family. And seated next to you is a young person, let's say about seven or eight years old, who you know well and care about. So imagine you're sitting next to this young person, and during this conversation you're having with them, they reveal to you that when they grow up, they would like to be a world-renowned scientist or engineer. I see some smiles on faces, naturally, you react with glee. <laughs> so for the last part of this exercise, I'd like you to sit and think for a few minutes about the things this young person might experience as they go through high school, college, their early and late careers. Who might they meet? What might they explore? What might they discover? So think about that for a few seconds. Great, thank you very much. Um, I would love to talk to some of you all after my talk about some of the things that you thought about. Uh, so I think this exercise is really important. Uh, in part because it gets us working our imaginations and thinking about people that we care about, but also in part because I believe it can be incredibly generative. I think that some of the things that you all in the audience came up with in response to this prompt stand as an answer to a question that policymakers, educators, and researchers like myself have been asking for a number of years now. And that question is, how do we encourage more young people to pursue STEM, or science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, related fields of study and eventually careers? And for those of us that study this question, it's actually a really exciting time because there are all sorts of new educational innovations that are being developed that seem to address this issue. Right? So we've got lots of new information technologies that are opening up things like web-based learning platforms. We have people who are excited about experimenting with new ways of organizing the classroom experience. So this is a really good time because people are trying to contribute to this question. But as someone who has worked in this area, for the better part of the last 10 years as both an educator myself and now a researcher, I've become worried that a lot of the new innovations that we're focusing on in education that try to address this question are only addressing part of what's going on. Largely because they focus primarily on new ways of getting information and stimulated content to people. In my experiences over the course of the last decade working with educational programs, and observing student ex experiences has demonstrated that not only do we need to emphasize new ways of getting content and information, but we also need the, to emphasize the process of becoming that goes along with using that information powerfully. Believing from the beginning of your STEM education experience that you can become a part of the community that contributes to science, mathematics, engineering meaningfully. So if there's one thing I want you to remember from my talk, only one thing. It's that if, we try, if we're trying to encourage more young people to enter STEM careers and fields of study, that access to information is really important, but access to identities is much better. So I see some people nodding heads, which means you agree, which I like. I see some people with confused faces, which I also like because it means you'll probably listen that much better throughout the rest of the presentation as I try to clarify this. Um, to, so to clarify what I mean by access to information is good and access to identities is better, I'm going to introduce you to a program that I worked with as a young researcher, and also a particular student who participated in that program. So the program was called the Digital Youth Network, and it was operated in conjunction with a middle school in the Midwest. And this middle school, though it had a mixed income population, it, it had low-income students and middle-income students, managed to secure access to laptops for kids to use at home and at school which was really cool. And this digital youth network program, which operated kind of outside of the normal classroom structure, was charged with, on the one hand, helping kids to gain additional technology skills. So using the laptops that much better. But on the other hand, this program sought a deeper mission to give students a particular perspective. In particular, it tried to help middle school students become critical consumers and producers of media and culture. 
So it felt like the adolescence that it was working with. We're getting all of these messages about what the world was, what was going on in the world through media, and that these young people, in order to be effective 21st century citizens, needed to be able to critically think about those messages and use powerful technologies, tools, to respond to those messages. So when I was charged with working with this program, I was really excited because it seemed to get at the heart of why I was interested in technology. Um, so just a little bit about, about me. Um, I've been a technology geek for it as long as I could remember. Um, as a child, I was really fortunate to have access to a computer in an early age. It had about 400 megabytes of memory in the entire thing, um, <laughs> which in today's standards is about a little bit more than half of what it takes to store a digital movie. Um, but I love working with this thing. I played video games, I learned to type on it, and I was even given a programming book by a family member that I used to copy programs directly from the book into the computer. I tried to get them to work. If you've done much programming, you know what happens when you start out. You forget periods and semicolons and everything breaks down. Um, but I developed a special passion for technology in general, in computing in particular, when I figured out ways that I could take interest that I had outside of the world of computing and use what I was learning in the book to apply to them. So as a kid, I was a big fan of James Bond. Anything spy-related or clandestine, I was really into. And the first program I made on my own was a cryptography program where you had to uncover the secret code. And really all it was was something that would spit out a random string of letters, and if you could change those letters into a sentence, you won the game. It was exciting. But it gave me a chance to try on the identity of being in the British Secret Service. Um, <laughs> and, and my interest in learning in STEM fields throughout my adult life, or at least the part that I was most passionate about, continued on this track where I would have lots of different interests outside of STEM and use the things I was learning in STEM to make them more in-depth and more powerful. So I learned about creative expression by delving into digital, digital photography. I deepened my interest in communication and community building by using the power of the web to connect with friends and family who live far away. And I even furthered my interest in social justice by using the web to research and eventually produce content on civil rights history. So when I got the opportunity to work with this Digital Youth Network program as a part of my research job, I was ecstatic because I would get to see that development happen with kids all the way along their middle school year. There was one student I was in particular excited to work with um, because he reminded me a lot of me at the age. So we'll call him Sean. He was a lanky kid with a big smile and a lot of ideas. He was someone that was really enthusiastic about video games and martial arts related cartoons much like I was as a kid, and I was super excited to see how he would enter this program and perhaps find technology-related passions of his own. Now, I mentioned that Sean was like me in a number of ways, but he was also not like me in some ways. Coming into sixth grade, he wasn't someone that teachers would have called traditionally a good student. He struggled in some of his classes. He seemed to have too many ideas for the classes to handle, and some of the other kids referred to him as random. Um, <laughs> which was hard. He didn't receive a lot of validation in his normal day-to-day -day middle school life. But he entered this Digital Youth Network program and chose to participate in their game design track. And there he found a home for his energy and his excitement. He became very quickly known among teachers and students as someone who would work tirelessly on games and go after multiple different ideas at one, point, at one time. When we talked to him in the sixth grade, he said, well, I usually like, I work on here, referring to his laptop, like different times. Like last Tuesday, I was here all the way up until 6 o'clock just working on the video game. Everybody knows that I'd be on my laptop and I'd be making a lot of games. <laughs> Throughout middle school, Sean became known as someone who's a game head. On into seventh grade, he was making more in-depth games, more exciting games. And by the time he got to eighth grade, he came to know himself not only as a game designer, but also a software engineer. When we talked to him at the end of eighth grade, he said, when I apply for an engineering job, presumably at the end of college, I will say that I had 11 years working of experience working with technology from middle school to college. Because he wanted to pursue a high school track and a college track that was going to allow him to build on these skills. And he eventually wanted to use these skills to make history. So I bring up Sean's example in part because it's an exciting success story. Um, but in part because it shows a good example of how when you encourage someone to believe that they can be something from the very beginning of starting to learn about the content matter, then it makes a difference from not only how they approach the subject, 
but how they approach other people, how they approach the school experience in general. The other major reason that I bring up Sean's story is that while it's really cool and exciting for those of us who work with him, it's not a miracle. It is an outgrowth of a conscious attempt among educational programs to encourage students to believe that they can be as a part of the learning process. Now, I've worked with a number of educational programs that try to encourage young people to get into STEM, and I find that this is what makes the difference among the strongest ones. And I think the strongest ones do it by avoiding what I call the three big myths of STEM education. So the first myth that strong programs avoid is the idea that interest is something that exists within students uh, that grows independently. So many of us are familiar with stories, perhaps, of people who become masters in a field of physics or chemistry or something like that, um, but did so after having a passion at a very early age. They, they relentlessly pursued um, and eventually, you know, maybe in their teenage years, discovered something new and on and on and on and on, became wonderful in the field. Um, and those stories make great movies and good news headlines, but it doesn't reflect what actually happens with most students. Education research suggests that interest, particularly in STEM fields, tends to build in phases, with the first phase being characterized by friends, family members, teachers introducing you to a topic or activity, the next stage being characterized by constantly being reintroduced by other people and getting materials to build and support that interest, and only the last stage being characterized by young people pursuing their own learning opportunities in an area. In Sean's case, he came into the Digital Youth Network program with an interest in game playing, but it was only through interactions with peers and mentors that he learned to build his skills step by step, enter new areas of game design that he hadn't thought about, and come in contact with new software that would help him build it. So strong programs avoid this interest grows independently myth by recognizing that interest is nurtured through learning, socializing, and experience, and filling students' lives with the opportunities to interact with those things. Next, strong programs avoid the myth that subject matter can be separated from contact. This myth suggests that, hey, if you're really into biology, it doesn't really matter if you have a bad teacher or a bad learning environment, you'll eventually learn how to do biology and be successful at it. Once again, research suggests that this is not the case. Research into computer science education shows that feeling like you can relate to a teacher or mentor can be predictive of whether you'll enter a computer science class or eventually pursue the field. Similarly, simply feeling unwelcome in a physical environment can dissuade you from being interested in pursuing perhaps computer science tracks. This research has been used to in part give us information about why we see gender differences and who pursues computer science. Smart programs realize that who you're learning from and where you're learning is intimately tied to how interested you are in a subject. In Sean's case, instructors were really smart about bringing his interest into martial arts video games into the game design space and encouraging him to use those game design fundamentals he was learning to further deepen his interest in cartoons. Smart programs realize that what we learn and do is tied to where we are and who we're with, and they build welcoming learning environments. Finally, strong programs avoid the myth that they should challenge students to be the best. So this is perhaps my most controversial point um, on the slide deck. Uh, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't challenge students to push their boundaries and push their limits. What I am saying is that research suggests that we have to be really careful about how we do that challenging. Research that compares students who are focused on doing well on tests and compares them to students who are more interested in mastering and learning material, shows that both groups tend to do well when tasks are easy, but when tasks get difficult, those students that are solely focused on showing what they know tend to have a harder time, whereas students who are more focused on learning material and mastering it tend to persevere. Right? So what we want students to do is focus on taking what they know, building on it step by step, and not just doing well on tests. In Sean's case, welcoming spaces were created for students to showcase their work and provide feedback on other students' work so they could build on what they were doing step by step, as opposed to creating sink or swim learning environments 
where either you made it or you didn't. Strong programs take the research into account and they challenge students to do their best and then they challenge students to beat their own personal best time and time again. So I offer three points um, that kind of help to show what differentiates the programs that do a good job of doing this learning facts and information approach plus the becoming approach, integrating an access to identities type of framework. And I think this is really important. I would say take it with you, use it to encourage the young people in your lives, and use it to differentiate those programs that you should be sending them to from others. To conclude though, I'd like to return to the activity that we did at the beginning. Because while I think this is, these are all important things to have within a program itself, I think the process of encouraging more young people to become STEM practitioners really lies in the act of imagination. What you were doing at the proverbial dinner table that we talked about at the beginning. And not only imagining within yourselves what students can do, but encouraging students to imagine what they can do if they go beyond what the material they're learning is saying, and think about the discoveries that they could eventually make. I mentioned that I'm excited about all the new ways that we're finding to integrate information technology and information methods into education. But really what would make me most excited is finding new methods to inspire students' imagination. Thank you. Thank you.